Hello and welcome to General Organic Chemistry Part 3 screencast. And um, last video we talked about the inductive effect, which was the uh, particle nature of the electron. And uh, before we begin the resonance effect, which describes the wave nature of an electron, I would like to draw your attention on how this wave nature of an electron came out to be. Uh, how was it discovered and who proposed it? So in this short video, we're going to talk about the matter waves, the de Broglie wavelength. Uh, Louis Vector de Broglie, a French physicist, proposed for the first time the principle of matter waves in 1924, for which he received the Nobel Prize in 1929. Uh, his work was greatly influenced by Max Planck and uh, Einstein. In his doctoral thesis, which was titled The Research on the Theory of Quanta, de Broglie extended the Einstein's theory of wave-particle duality of light to all the particles. If you remember, Einstein had proved using the photoelectric effect that light is not just wave, it is also a particle. This was an extension of the uh, Max Planck's theory. Now, incidentally, it was Einstein who was given the job of evaluating the thesis of de Broglie, and he wholeheartedly welcomed and endorsed the symmetry that de Broglie wanted to bring about between waves and particles. Uh, according to de Broglie, any particle in motion has an associated wavelength, now known as the de Broglie's wavelength. So this means that any particle, be it a subatomic particle or a macro particle, it has an associated wavelength, which means it has a dual behavior. A particle can now also behave as a wave. And he even went on to calculate the wavelength of a particle using the Einstein's theory of relativity and the Planck's quantum theory. And this is what he did. Uh, what he did was he started with the um, theory of relativity, which said E equals mc squared. Now, what we should not confuse this equation is, do not think that this equation tells us the energy of a particle of mass m moving with velocity c. Because a particle having a defined mass cannot move with speed, the velocity of light. C is the velocity of light. Because velocity of light is the universal speed limit. Nothing can move even at the speed of light. Therefore, no particle of mass m can actually move the speed of light. So this is not the energy of a particle of mass m moving with is with speed c. This basically describes how mass can be converted into energy in a nuclear process. In a nuclear reaction, mass is not conserved. Some mass is lost, and this mass is lost in the form of energy. And this, this conversion of mass into energy is given by this equation E equals mc squared. That means if m mass disappears in a nuclear reaction, then the energy associated with it, the energy that is uh, going to be produced by the disappearance of that mass m is given as E equals mc squared. Now, based on this, if we look at what is E over c, you get mc. If I take one c from here and put it down here, I get mc, and mc, you know, mass into velocity is momentum. So, momentum is E by c. And now, if I use the Max Planck's quantum theory, E equals h nu, which is hc by lambda. And if I bring this C down, again I get E by C. E by C is H over lambda. So in a way, H over lambda is P. So if H over lambda is P, then lambda equals H over P. That means the wavelength of a particle having a momentum P is given as H over P, which is equal to lambda. Now, uh, Objects such as uh, marbles or cricket balls or macro objects never seem to behave like waves. The basic reason is that in spite of the fact that the velocity of these particles is not very large, but the Max Planck's constant is so small that the wavelength calculated based on the de Broglie's wavelength is going to be smaller than the nuclear size. Therefore, such a wave nature is never observed for a macro particle. And finally, in 1927, at Bell Labs, Davison and Germer fired slow-moving electrons at a crystalline nickel target. And uh, they were able to find out the angular dependence of the reflected electron intensity. And they, would, they were able to find out that it is very similar uh, in pattern to the, the one that is predicted by Bragg's law for X-rays. 
and Bragg's law for X-rays is meant for diffraction pattern. And before the acceptance of the de Broglie's hypothesis, diffraction was a property that was totally associated only with waves. Therefore, the presence of a diffraction pattern above of an electron beam demonstrated the wave-like nature of matter. When the de Broglie's wavelength was inserted into the Bragg condition, the observed diffraction pattern was predicted thereby experimentally confirming the de Broglie's hypothesis for electrons. So what we basically need to understand from all of this is particles are those which are localized. Particles have a fixed position. Whereas a wave does not have a fixed position. It is delocalized. For example, if you're sitting in a room and you're holding a pen in your hand, if you ask someone, where is the pen? The person can say the pen is in your hand. They can localize it. They can pinpoint where the coordinates of the pen is. But as you're talking to the person, if you ask the person, where is my, my sound? They will find that it's not possible to localize the sound. They can't say the sound is exactly where they are because there are other people in the room who are also hearing you. So the sound is also those places where other people are present. So the sound is delocalized. In fact, if you extend this hypothesis, you can even say that the sound is not just limited inside the room. The sound can be even outside the room because people outside the room can also hear you. It is also possible that people who are outside the room a little distance away may not be able to hear you, but still the sound may be there because uh, just because of the intensity of the sound is not sufficient enough for them to be able to register the sound in their ear. Therefore, sound being a wave is delocalized. Therefore, we need to understand that a particle like an electron is both a particle as we saw in the inductive effect and is also a wave which isn't just localized in one position but is delocalized in other positions as well. And this is what we're going to find in the resonance effect which we're going to discuss in the next video. Thanks for watching.